controls of the Commodore VIC-20 home computer. Now, which one do you think really deserves to be called a computer? If you say the VIC-20, well, here's a little additional piece of information. The VIC-20 also plays games like you've never seen before. Mere child's play for a true computer. The Commodore VIC-20, a real computer for the price of a toy. So we'll take a look at the VIC-20 itself. It kind of gets overlooked um, because the Commodore 64, its kind of bigger brother, um, gets most of the attention. And uh, this is a slightly later model with um, the DIN power supply instead of the two pins. I have the earlier model as well, but um, this is probably one of my favorite in the colorings because it's just a really bright cream and it's got a really nice keyboard on it. The um, colors really go well together with the machine. Now the machine has is um, one megahertz. It's got 5k of memory with only three and a half k free um, and it kind of restricts what you can do with it. But at the time there wasn't much else out there that could do what the VIC-20 did. You know, especially with its um, colours and everything else that you could do on the machine. The only, the biggest issue we have is um, you've only got a very small amount of room on the screen. The characters are huge, okay? And um, the kind of, even a syntax error fills like a third of the screen. But again, there wasn't much out there to compete with it at the time. And because Commodore did the brilliant thing of installing a cartridge port, it meant that the, the games on, or the programs on these machines could be a lot more involved than the 3.5K would normally allow. The keyboard was nice. The keyboard was very, very nice. I mean, it wasn't as cost reduced as they did later on in its life, especially with the Commodore 64 later versions and especially the Commodore 16. The case is solid. You push on a Commodore 64 even and you get a little bit of creaking. This one is nothing at all. And if you push on a Commodore 16 in the same place, it feels like the machine's gonna snap. So the whole machine was much better built, much more solidly built. Now, the machine itself has a few expansion ports, which we'll show you now. Okay, on the side you have a single joystick port. You have your power, which is the five pinned in, so it's a slightly later machine, and obviously your power switch. Okay. On the back, Okay, you have a quite a big cartridge port all the way along. And, you know, a lot of these Victorines don't have that tiny little cutout, which isn't a broken piece of plastic. It's just the way the machine, the cases were formed. And then you have RF, which is an add-on. And then you also have your cassette port and your user port. So your cassette ports and user ports are here. Just on the end there, cassette and user port. And the cassette port uses the same version as the Commodore PET. Now, if you come back, you've also got a serial port, okay? The serial port is exactly the same as the one used on the PET, and it was the same as used on the 64, okay. the Plus 4, the C16, every Commodore range. So they kept the serial port and the cassette port exactly the same. The cartridge port, however, is very different. It's twice the size of the one used on the other machines and then what they did is they reduced it on the 64 so you could get the RF port built into the machine simply because these had to use an external RF box which is a quite nicely polished high polished one it looks quite smart but again it's another thing to have hanging out of the back of your machine or probably hide it down the back of the TV or your you know in your living room at the time but it's a highly 
capable machine. It was the first machine to have some say 16 colors. Um, technically it is 16 colors because you have eight foreground and eight background colors all accessible on these keys at the top. And um, they also have, if you look on the side of the keys, you have pet ASCII symbols, okay, which are little graphic symbols that you can bring up from the keys themselves. Because remember, this machine doesn't really have any graphics modes at all, and it doesn't have any sprites. But what it does have is quite a good sound chip for its time. And the sound chip is arguably way ahead of most of the other machines out there, probably with the exception of the Atari range, the 400 and the 800, which had a much more advanced sound chip. But it wasn't bad. And it did the arcade noises and small music pieces that you could have needed at the time. The machine was capable, and if you compare it to a Sinclair Spectrum, which came later... Solution graphics, up to a massive 48K of RAM, sound and full 8 colour capability, all available from £125. I give you the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Again, there's not much comparison in its feel and its use and its build quality because the VIC-20 at the time was very, very well built where the Sinclair Spectrum um, kind of wasn't. Um, it was... Some say it was far too cost reduced just to hit a price point. But technically the, the Spectrum was a superior machine technically because of its 48K and its faster clock speeds and so on. But expansion wise, it didn't have a patch on even the Commodore VIC-20 because there was no disk drive port no serial port you just had an analog era mic socket for your cassette loading rather than the commodore's all digital unit which was incredibly reliable that's probably one of the reasons why the vic 20 got such a foothold and sold a lot of machines it was the first machine to sell over a million uh, so a single machine like this it was unheard of for them to sell a million machines and this kind of broke that barrier and then some now there are people out there who um, quite unfairly compare this to the Commodore VIC-20 the ZX81 And very unfairly, I think, because the ZX81 here was never really meant to be a competitor to the VIC-20. It wasn't meant to be a competitor to anything. The ZX81 was meant to be a low-cost, entry-level computer that you could walk in as an impulse buy in WH Smith's and take it home and play with it or not and you can't really compare the two the um, ZX81 fully built was under £70 the VIC-20 when it was launched was almost four to five times that price and um, that was the difference uh, not many school kids at the time could go out and buy one of these but they could go out and buy one of these parents were actually more likely to buy a vic 20 for themselves 
and more than likely pass it down to their children or buy and let their children use it rather than buy a machine outright for the school children to use which is where this came in so comparing them both is kind of ridiculous really but you know that's the way um, some people are doing it and it's not right it's it's kind of it's like comparing a sports car to an Austin Mini or you know a Chevrolet Cavalier to a, a real car and um, it's it's never gonna work okay so <clears throat> the um, Commodore VIC-20 should not really be compared to the ZX81 it should probably be compared more to its contemporaries okay which um, its contemporaries which I mean by color computers such as the TRS-80 which then kind of evolved into the Dragon 32 now that would have been a better comparison let the Radio Shack TRS-80 put the world of color computing into your home instant loading program packs turn any color TV into an exciting game arcade and there's more the color computer is an educational aid a home management tool and up-to-the-minute electronic information service the programmable expandable trs-80 color computer from 399 dollars only at radio shack the biggest name in little computers in that case apart from memory the vic 20 would probably give the trs-80 and the dragon 32 a run for its money especially in the sound and capability stakes the advantage the vic 20 had over a lot of the computers that came after it was its cartridge slot so if we turn the machine on with the cartridge in as soon as the uh, the display is on the tv you'll find that the game is already running but one of the most useful cartridges was the RAM Expander. This one's now running 16K RAM Expander, which is given it 19, nearly 20K free, which is quite a big amount for a, a computer of the time. But the downside is, is that most of the games were written for the original memory size of the Commodore VIC-20 to fit in 3.5K. And that's why most of the cassette software uses an unexpanded VIC-20 which was a shame I think the only other machine that had a RAM expander that was used as a matter of course was the ZX81 because nearly everybody bought a 16k RAM expander for that so there was a lot of software brought out for it using that amount of memory where the VIC-20 didn't it relied on people using cartridges if they wanted their games to be bigger than 3.5k with the likes of um, Jelly Monsters. Which is a really good clone of Pac-Man. But if we turn the machine off, you can see the advantage of cartridges over anything else. Switch it on. And then we have instant game. No waiting, no messing, straight there within seconds. The problem with these machines is this box, this um, RF box. It's not a brilliant picture and it shifts the image to the left on most modern LCDs, but it be can be cured by using a SCART lead. They're available very cheaply and widely available through the internet or most auction sites on most retro computer stores now. Okay, so the Commodore VIC-20 is often overlooked in the microcomputing scene. It's overlooked because of its bigger brother, the Commodore 64. And uh, I think that's quite a bit of a shame, really, because it's a lot more capable as a computer than most people seem to realise. The biggest problem is that it gets compared maybe very unfavourably um, with the Sinclair machines, especially the ZX Spectrum, but it also gets compared to the ZX81. Now the ZX81 came out at roughly the same time, 
they um, had completely different markets and they had completely different ideas of which market those machines were going to go into and comparing them both is not fair on either machine the ZX81 was aimed at people who wanted to start out learning about computers where the VIC-20 was a much more rounded machine in, and a much more expensive machine and it um, was almost as capable as the Apple II and it also had kind of more rounded qualities with its keyboard and its better graphics, better sound, colour, all this kind of thing where the ZX81 was just a monochrome machine and they didn't even know about each other really when they first come out because they're on different sides of the pond. Now comparing it to the Spectrum of well is not a good idea because the Spectrum technically was more advanced than the Commodore VIC-20 in a lot of areas and it was also a machine that came out a lot later than when the VIC-20 was launched originally. Now it should have been more compared towards the TRS-80 as we said and I think that would have been a fair comparison for any VIC-20 in any TRS-80 TRS around at the time and um, also it could have been compared to the TI-99-4A as well and it would have come out quite favourably when compared to both of those machines but as I said the um, VIC-20 seems to be lost a little bit as far as reviews and as far as technical documentaries are concerned and you know most of the documentaries around the micro it's, it's getting lost in the background and I think that's a shame so I've got more to come on the um, VIC-20 so I hope if you you know you'd like to subscribe and I hope you like what you've seen and I hope to meet you on this channel very shortly okay so thanks for watching thanks goodbye